Yes, I think we're, we're able to swallow that. So, my name is John Bacon Schoen. I'm very happy to welcome you all here today on behalf of the Knowledge Exchange Office. Jasper, as you may know, is a therapy dog from our Hong Kong U Library. This is his quiet period, right? Because the exams are all over. Uh, okay, so he's decided he's had enough. That's okay. <laughs> So if you want to meet him, you'll get an opportunity. He's probably going to come around and visit some of you, it looks like. So why do we have these talks today? So as, you, as was mentioned by the MC, the government is doing a consultation on animal welfare. And so there are a number of issues, I think, raised about animal welfare in Hong Kong and how animals can benefit us. So I, I went to look up, because I'm a statistician, I went to look for the latest statistics. So apparently, there are about 4% of households in Hong Kong who keep cats, uh, at least who will admit to keeping cats, and 5.7% of households admit to keeping dogs. So when I say admit, because the Census Department admits themselves that some people don't have their pets legally, so they perhaps don't want to record it. But the thing that fascinated me is that only 9.4% of all households who keep dogs or cats. So that means nearly all households either keep dogs or they keep cats. But almost no households in Hong Kong keep dogs and cats. So that means you must be either a dog household or a cat household. So I'm not going to give much of an introduction today because I think the four speakers all have very interesting things to tell you, things about their research and how their research links to animal welfare in very different ways from animals that we are perhaps buying and selling for eating, uh, animals we're looking after, animals which are benefiting us. So you're going to hear four very different perspectives of animal welfare today. And at the end, we're going to have a couple of questions that I will try and get discussion going. But if you have some burning questions, please store them up so that we can have a, a more open discussion at the end. So I'm now going to hand you back to our MC and our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bacon Schoen and Jasper. Now, our researchers will share with you their projects in relation to animals and their professional values relating to animal welfare. May I now invite Ms. Amanda Whitford of the Department of Professional Legal Education to give a presentation on wildlife crime and animal victims, improving access to justice in Hong Kong. Ms. Whitford, please. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon to talk to you about my research. Um, I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm not going to mess around. Uh, illegal trade um, in wildlife is a global problem, but it's at its worst in Asia. Demand for endangered species for food, as pets, and for traditional Chinese medicine is growing. Hong Kong's geographic location makes it a gateway to China. It is an extremely attractive territory to smugglers. It is recognized globally as a wildlife trading hub. And in seeking to address that, the Hong Kong government recently passed amendments to CAP 586, that's the Protection for Endangered Species of Plants and Animals Ordinance, which have raised the maximum penalty for the most endangered species to 10 years imprisonment. Will this be enough to counter a trade that has been ranked as the fourth most lucrative black market in the world? In Hong Kong, seizures equating to $100 million are made every year. The average value of these seizures is now second only to the average value in dangerous drugs. Yet there is no special unit to counter wildlife crime. There are no specialist prosecutors to deal with wildlife cases. There is no specialized environmental court, and it is not yet regarded, if it ever will be, as what it is, which is organized and serious crime in the most part. In Asia, as in many parts of the world, anthropocentric attitudes apply to animals. Wildlife crime is not considered to be a serious crime, and animals are not regarded as real victims. And this view, unfortunately, is supported by CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. 
This convention is intended to penalise trade beyond sustainable levels and manage natural resources for human benefit. Accordingly, CITES, and indeed the Convention on Biological Diversity, do not seek to protect wildlife for the sake of the animals themselves. These treaties are hampered in their ability to deal with wildlife crime by their conservation objectives. In adopting conservation biology principles to address harm, they favour only the level of threat to an animal. They focus on the level at a specific given time and manage access from that basis. The conventions, therefore, are largely silent as to the welfare needs of animals and the problems that arise in capture, transport and poaching. Unfortunately, this has resulted in the exclusion of even highly endangered species welfare interests from in international instruments. Can domestic legislation fill this gap? Domestic animal cruelty laws can, of course, only address cruelty that is suffered within the jurisdiction in which the law is passed. Of course, smuggling charges might be laid, but local laws like CAP 586 largely reflect back only the concerns of CITES. In other words, they focus on conservation harms rather than welfare harms. To respond to wildlife crime effectively, we need local loot local cruelty laws to routinely to be applied in cases where animals have been smuggled illegally into the territory. But this would require not only that police, but customs officers recognise cruelty to wildlife and move beyond CITES concerns. But it would also require judges and prosecutors to recognise animal cruelty in relation to wild animals. And that is a matter of knowledge and expertise. To this end, we are assisted to some extent by an expanding notion in the law as to who might be a victim. New societal attitudes allow for harms to human victims to be recognised by courts even where prosecutions have not taken place and convictions have not been recorded. But for animals, the situation is different. Animals are traditionally excluded from victim status. They have a lack of standing under the law, and their property status allows them to be forfeited, transferred, euthanized, but doesn't necessarily recognize their welfare needs. Very occasionally, harm to ecosystems are addressed by restoration or compensation orders, but it's highly unusual for direct welfare harms to be recognized in environmental law. An alternative view is granted by an emerging new field, green criminology. With its focus on eco-justice, green criminology provides that humans are only one part of a complex ecosystem. Once we recognize that, we can begin to acknowledge both the direct harms to animals in trade, through poaching and transport, and the indirect harms to non-target species and habitats, through removal of endangered animals and plants. This approach is consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and our increasing understanding as humans of our responsibilities to other species. Unfortunately, studies by traffic and others have repeatedly shown that there is limited understanding of the effects of wildlife crime within key personnel in the criminal justice system. And I'm talking, of course, of the prosecutors and the judges. And a lack of understanding naturally impedes deterrent sentencing. Now, I am a lawyer, so I have a conflict. I'm also a prosecutor. But I am going to tell you, quite honestly, that not all of this is the lawyer's fault. In part, it is a result of gaps in the scientific literature. Unlike for domestic species, Sufficient robust studies have not always been done to allow experts to agree on the objective welfare needs and even the ecological impacts of poaching and trade on some of the rarest species of wild animals. But where that data does exist, greater effort could be involved in effectively translating it to a form accessible and understandable to police to lawyers, to judges and prosecutors involved in wildlife crime cases. 
In recent years, a practice has begun to develop in Scotland. And this practice allows for preparation of victim impact statements for species and ecosystems in environmental crime. The Crown Office has begun to seek reports on the impact of wildlife crime from NGOs in Scotland, including Scottish National Heritage. And these victim impact statements include the societal, economic, and the species harms that are caused by wildlife offending. As a result, judges receive information that improves their capacity to recognize the impact of wildlife crime, and prosecutors are starting to notice an increase in deterrent sentencing. A review of this practice in 2015 by the Wildlife Crime Penalties Review Group called on the Scottish Government to promote this practice by giving it legislative footing. Whilst that has not happened, the Scottish Government has publicly declared this to be a success in their ability to combat, to combat environmental crime and called on prosecutors and judges to increase what is and was an ad hoc practice and increasingly is becoming common. In 2015, I started to explore the possibility for developing wildlife trade impact statements to assist our prosecutors and judges in Hong Kong. Wildlife crime, as I've said, is a very significant problem here. Since 2000, over 40 tons of illegal ivory have been seized. Lax controls on trade, including the continual allowance for so-called pre-CITES ivory, have made the city one of the largest ivory markets in the world. It is also the point of seizure of much of the pangolin trade due to demand for traditional Chinese medicine. Scales seized here over the last six years represent the deaths of over 100,000 pangolins. Less well known is that Hong Kong takes 80% of the regional live fish trade, much of which is endangered and smuggled in contravention of regional export quotas. In response, I began working with biologists at the Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden to draft impact statements for the territory's most smuggled species. In Hong Kong, most of the smuggling relates to smaller, lesser known animals. So we designed statements for 50 rare, critically endangered species, including turtles and tortoises, all eight species of pangolin, and several species of fish. Our statements provide reliable scientific knowledge for judges and prosecutors, giving them the tools to respond effectively to wildlife crime. Going forward, we're continuing to add new species to our statement list and developing a new section on the possible forensic tests available to assist with prosecutions, thanks to the work of the School of Biological Sciences Wildlife Crime Forensics Lab. In adopting this multidisciplinary approach, we hope to improve the transfer of knowledge between scientists and lawyers. We're not seeking to challenge established practices. We don't envisage that our species impact statements will ever be handed up to judges in the way that they currently are as a matter of practice in Scotland. But they can be used to inform prosecutions and sentencing decisions. It's early days, but we are hopeful that the statements will have a positive effect on the understanding within the criminal justice system of the wide-ranging harms that are done to animals in illegal trade. So my message is quite simple. Conservation science can and should be used to inform sentencing for wildlife crime, and in doing so, we'll imp we will improve access to environmental justice. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Whitford. May I now invite Dr. David Baker of the School of Biological Sciences to give a presentation on conservation forensics at Hong Kong U. Dr. Baker, please. Thank you very much. So following on Amanda's excellent talk, uh, I can share with you a little bit about what we're doing at the University of Hong Kong to help address the forensic side, the enforcement side of this complex problem. And as she rightly highlighted, wildlife trade is one of the most lucrative black market uh, criminal activities on the planet. And if you sum up uh, this statistic here with illegal fishing and illegal logging, it definitely becomes one of the, the most serious 
uh, sources of criminal activity on the planet. So that's indisputable. And many of us in the room, we know a lot about some of the high-profile organisms that are targeted by this illegal trade. We often think of elephant ivory, which can attract 42,000 US dollars per tusk, or, or rhino horn, which can approach almost 100,000 US dollars per horn. And at these prices, uh, these commodities are more valuable on a per weight basis than most narcotics and some precious metals. So you can easily see why there is an attraction to exploiting these species. The other issue is that many of these species don't reproduce very quickly, and their populations are not sustainably harvested in any way. So for that reason, you have rare species that equates to a limited supply, plus an unlimited global demand, and you have prices that are, are running away. Um, the profit margins are therefore huge, and therefore, from a, a criminal mind perspective, the reward greatly exceeds the risk. And that is further uh, exacerbated by the fact that many of these criminal syndicates take advantage of impoverished, impoverished people who, um, you know, because of their impoverished status, will be the one to fire the bullet to take the animal. And they'll be the one to traffic those products overseas because they're desperate for that income. Um, and often the people who are behind those syndicates are not putting themselves in any personal risk whatsoever, and they're very difficult to track down. So this is why we need uh, forensics. We need scientific data and evidence to, to contribute to these prosecutions and, and get to the source of the issue. Amanda already expertly pointed out that we are a, a hub for the illegal wildlife trade, exploiting populations of species throughout Southeast Asia and Africa. This is primarily due to Hong Kong's status as a free port. So it's, uh, it just so happens that it's convenient and it's cost effective to bring these products through Hong Kong on their way to China and other markets. Um, so because Hong Kong has such a powerful and well-established global trade presence, it's natural for illegal commodities to be entrained in that supply chain. Now, we are all familiar with the headlines that we see, and as Amanda also pointed out, we're talking about tons. We measure the, the volume of traded species and their products by the ton. And it almost seems that on a, on a monthly or weekly basis, we're, we're getting headlines like these in the popular press. Um, the values are astonishing. The, the mass of material is shocking. And what we have to remind ourselves is that for each pair of tusks, we're talking about one animal that's been removed from, from the wild. Uh, for each uh, consignment of these pangolin scales, we're talking about thousands of individuals. And when you start to understand the biology of these species and how much of, of a range that they actually occupy, you start to appreciate that, that we are really wiping them out at a very astonishing speed. Now, why is this an issue? It's because a lot of these products are very easy to launder. Uh, a recent example from Elephant Ivory is that instead of shipping the, the raw tusks, which are easily identified uh, with an x-ray machine, uh, these traffickers are now carving the tusks into mahjong tiles. So the mahjong tiles go undetected through customs. So they're clever ways of hiding and concealing these products that allow their trade to continue. We also have a diversity of wildlife that's really hard to, to grasp, even from a biologist's perspective. This is a dried seafood shop that we're familiar with just down the street from us, which has many hundreds of species whose identity is largely unknown, whose origin is largely unknown, so we don't even have a good understanding of the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. And those are just the species that we're importing. We also have species locally that have conservation value, that are under threat from human exploitation. Uh, these are yellow-crested cockatoos, which you can see flying around our campus. They're an invasive species here in Hong Kong, but they actually represent the second largest population of these birds on the planet. And so therefore, they have a very high conservation value for protecting them. But even these birds are not safe here, as it's been documented that people are poaching uh, chicks from the nests of the parents to put into the pet trade. 
And likewise, we have, uh, we have poachers that are coming into Hong Kong and they are chopping down agarwood, agarwood or the incense trees, which give Hong Kong its namesake of fragrant harbor. So the, we are the last home for these trees in their natural environment. And people are slowly hacking them to bits and taking them back into the mainland. So the list goes on and on. And for this reason, my colleagues and I in the School of Biological Sciences, as well as the Department of Earth Science, have decided that to work together to address these problems, and it builds on a legacy of conservation biology that's existed at Hong Kong U for many decades. But we've decided to combine these terms, so conservation biology with the scientific investigation of crime. And that's where we come up with this term, conservation forensics. And we use a lot of scientific tools from DNA tests to geochemical tests and also looking at data and analytics to try to build evidence and intelligence for fighting against this serious problem. And our perspective is that we really want to be a resource that the government can rely upon to augment their enforcement efforts. So we have a lot of expertise in different species, and so I'm going to talk you through a few examples of what we do uh, right now. So first, a project that I was involved in dealt with a curious case of these tiny little fish that were being smuggled through the Hong Kong airport live by the thousands. And this was a new issue that emerged a few years ago, and government officials and customs were baffled as to what these were. And so we conducted a DNA test to confirm that these were eels that were coming from Europe, the European eel, which is a critically endangered species. And so this happened to be a pretty serious piece of evidence to confirm the tr illegal transit of European eels, which are critically endangered and prohibited from export from the European Union. And we were the first to, uh, to verify that this trade route existed. Uh, that, those data, we c with government's permission, we shared them with Spain and uh, Europol, which were conducting a, a Europe-wide investigation on this illegal trade. And it led to 40 arrests and the breakup of this criminal syndicate just from sending them some DNA sequences. But then we have the question, where is this going? Where are the eels going? Well, they're going into China, and they're being grown into large adults. And they have about a 3,000% profit margin. And then what's happening is that they're being relabeled as just eel. So the identity of where they come from is totally lost. And they're being resold back to us. So we did a survey of 7-Eleven and Welcome and all the grocery stores and convenience stores in Hong Kong. And we found that 50% or so of the eel products were actually European eels. So we're all eating endangered species, and we don't know about it. And I think that's pretty shocking. Uh, we are also working on other organisms that are, are of an emergent issue. So these are hem helmeted hornbills with the mainland uh, cracking down on ivory trade. There is a, there's a substitution effect that happens. So if I can no longer purchase ivory, I still have the desire for a product that is attractive to my eyes. And so these poor hornbills are now the next victim. There's virtually nothing known about the biology of these birds, which populations are being impacted. So we have a team that's working in their native range to try to identify which populations are being affected and learning a little bit about their genetics as well so we can develop new forensic tools. Another example has to do with the live fish trade, which Amanda mentioned is, is a very lucrative trade, and Hong Kong is the global epicenter for it, exploiting uh, the, the reef fish from most of Southeast Asia for our, lives, our live seafood restaurants. And because of the, um, the lax enforcement on live fish imports, uh, there's really no intelligence as to what's happening in our wet markets, what's being sold there. Uh, because the volume is just so huge, 22,000 tons, she mentioned earlier. And if you approach a, a vendor, well, most of them are unlikely to cooperate with an investigation. So we decided to develop a tool that uses a passive uh, approach. So we simply walk around wet markets and we slurp up the water that's on the floor. And the water that's on the floor is coming out of the aquariums and the tanks, and it's being spilled out of buckets when people are transporting fish around. And that water contains remnants of the DNA of all the fish that are being sold. And when you slurp up that water and we do DNA sequencing on it, we can create an entire species list of all the fish that are being sold in the market on that day. 
and we, the, the method works quite well, and we're now talking with government about how they can use it as an intelligence gathering mechanism. Uh, we also have a, a, a group that's working on differentiating between captive bred and wild caught animals because it's fine for someone to say, oh, I'm farming these turtles, so it's sustainable. But in fact, in many cases, they're, they're still taking those animals from the wild. They're lying and they're mislabeling their products and we can catch them. Uh, for example, with, with these yellow crested cockatoos, we can measure the chemistry of their feathers and we can tell whether or not they've been fed a wild diet, a natural diet, or if they're being given something from a human, a pet food, for example. We can tell very clearly. And similarly, with, with live fish trade, we have a group that's working on image recognition and fingerprinting. So we can identify individuals based on their, their facial marking using machine learning algorithms and advanced artificial intelligence. So we can even crowdsource these data from people who are passionate about conservation. You can snap a photo of this Somme or the Napoleon Rass. You can snap a photo and upload it to a cloud and we can confirm whether or not this individual was imported legally into Hong Kong. And likewise, the last example is that we are using the same sorts of technologies, image recognition, to take photographs of shark fins because shark fins have a unique uh, pattern on their skin that is related to the species of shark. Now there are hundreds of species of sharks out there, so imagine if you're a customs official and your job is to screen tons and tons of shark fins that are coming through the border every day, and your job is to identify whether or not those bags of shark fins have any of the 12 species that are presently protected by international treaty. It's nearly an impossible task. Our job is to develop technology so that you can scan the shark fins and you can identify the problematic ones immediately and then proceed to doing genetic testing to confirm that they are indeed illegal. So with that, I'd like to thank our sponsors and our partners and I'll pass the microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Baker. May I now invite Dr. Kelvin To of the Department of Microbiology to give a presentation on animal welfare, importance in biological research. Dr. So, please. So, thank you for coming. So, uh, I would like to switch gear and talk about uh, biological research. So, first of all, why are animals used for animal research? So, I'm a clinical microbiologist. I work at the Department of Microbiology. So, for us, we in, uh, look at infections. So, they are actually important to understand the disease. For example, if we have a case of pneumonia due to a new pathogen, we need to understand why it causes this disease. And this is important for us to find out how to treat it. So, it's important to understand the pathogenesis of a disease. Secondly, we need to understand the bug. Sometimes we have new viruses or bacteria, for example, SARS or avian flu. And we need to understand why they cause the disease in humans. Third, we also uh, develop drugs or vaccines that help to treat or prevent infection. And how, to, how do we evaluate the effectiveness of these treatments or vaccines? Animal research is very important. And finally, some groups actually uh, do transmission studies. They will look at how, for example, will the avian influenza or the swine flu transmissible to human? What is the risk? And also, what is the risk of human-to-human -human transmission? So all these are very important biomedical questions that our animal research can contribute of course, whenever we think about animal research, the most important is to balance the benefits of the research and the problems with animal research. Of course, these research, they advance science and medicine. However, any animal research will cause some pain, fear, or distress in animals. So whenever we design any studies, we must think about this. When should animal, animals, any, animal experiments be performed or should not, they not be performed? 
So I extract this from the Hong Kong U Laboratory Animal Unit. They should only be performed when they are essential. When are they essential? That the knowledge from the animal experiment will be used, the new discovery will be useful for saving or prolonging life, alleviating suffering, or combating any disease, whether of human beings, animals, or plants. Secondly, even some experiments were done before, we may think it's not true, so sometimes you have to repeat some experiments to know whether they're true or not. And all these must be weighed against, weighed the scientific value against the potential effect on the welfare of the animal. So when we do animal research, we always think of three R's. Replacement, reduction, and refinement. What is replacement? Do not do animal experiments unless it's absolutely necessary. Is there another method other than using animal experiments to get the results that we want? Second is reduction. Can we lower the number of, can we use less or fewer animals to do the animal experiments to get the same scientific validity of the experiments? This is very important. So, one important discovery in the past few years is the use of organoids. Organoids are made in laboratories from single cells. So, they are like organs, but they are not taken from any animals. So, this is actually, they call it the model method of the year in uh, nature, the journal Nature Methods. In our department, uh, Dr. Zhao Jie actually is very interested in developing organoids. So she has learned from a master, uh, and we have just developed two different organoids. One is the airway organoid. This organoid mimics the human airway in a 2D and also 3D structure. So a lot of the, for example, if you have influenza, we can test how influenza affects the airway. So the airway is part of your lung, very important. Also intestine. This is an intestinal organoid. So what do we use it for? MERS. Okay, you may have heard of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, which is very new in the Middle East, uh, from camels, basically. One of the strange things is that it affects, causes diarrhea. So we actually looked at MERS virus in these intestinal organoids. So using these organoids, we can low, re, replace a lot of animal experiments and reduce the number of animals that are required to study these pathogens. So organoids are similar to an actual organ. They are more likely to mimic the situation in humans because they are actually made from human cells. Therefore, it replaced some experiments and reduced the number of animals. The third R is refinement. We are trying to alleviate or minimize potential pain and distress and also enhance the animal well-being. So, of course, we must be careful that we always have enough food and water for the animal. At the same time, we must have something for the animal to play with. For example, this gadget here and some, uh, something here. So the animals like to play with these. So these will help them to alleviate some of the pain and distress. So finally, I would like to say that good welfare equals good science. And this should be in the mind of all uh, uh, um, researchers who are doing animal experiments. Because if you are treating the animal badly, the results you not just for animal welfare, but also the results that you get will not be valid, and they will not be useful for any advancement in science or medicine. So I would like to stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. To. May I now invite Dr. Paul Wong of the Department of Social Work and Social Administration to give a presentation on the welfare of animals and animal-assisted interventions. Dr. Wong, please.
Thank you, thank you for coming. How are you guys? Good. Well, before I start, I want to ask you two questions. If you think Hong Kong is a uh, annual friendly place, put up your hands, please. Okay. Then next question is, passing the revised ordinance, do you think Hong Kong will be a animal friendly place? Probably not, huh? <laughs> oh, Amanda. Okay. So my talk is about how we think, our team, think that if we do this, there might be a possibility that we make Hong Kong a, a much more, well, not much more, but a, a more animal friendly places in, in, in this region. I am here to tell you our three years project is called the Caring Kids. In Chinese, it's Tonggao uh, Yawa Yi. So it's the children and the, to and the dogs having a chat together at schools. So please pardon my not so scientific talk because this is a new project. We don't have much data yet. So we just tell you the concepts. The actual name of the project is called Promotion of Empathy and Prosocial Behavior among P2 and P3 students through six sessions. And we use human education as an element, and we use social and emotional learning as the curriculum. And we are using trained dogs in Hong Kong, so we have a group of trained dogs participating in this um, primary school um, project. We have a small team. In Hong Kong U, we have the project officer, Rose, and training consultant, Kathy. We have Joe. And then we are working with these four collaborators in Hong Kong. They are the leading organizations of using trained animals or trained dogs in Hong Kong. So we have Animal Asia, we have Hong Kong AATA, we have Hong Kong IAAI, and Mongo Club. So together, we have a rather big community with volunteers and trained dogs and students and scholars. So the aims of the projects are to enhance the social and emotional competency of P2 and P3 students and to enhance students' animal-directed empathy. So we bring the dogs into the primary schools. So hopefully, with the interactions with the dogs, they would feel more intact or more engaged with the, with the dogs. And lastly, as a side agenda, we want to promote reading skills. How? I'll tell you later. This is the three, three years um, timeline. So we are just completed the pilot year. We went to three schools. So we have the consultants who went to the schools and teach the curriculum. And then there are a section called the reading to dogs um, part. So after the students listening to our talk, and the students have to read to the dogs with the books that we created. So it's called reading to the dog program. So these are the three schools. Then phase one. After the first three schools participated, and the teachers would become the person who deliver the curriculum. And then we have three more schools, so our staff will go to these three other new schools. The reason is, hopefully with this setup, the knowledge and the curriculum can be sustained after the funding ends in the future. Okay? But help is needed. Do you know why? We are not lacking schools to participate in this program. We are lacking of volunteers. We are lacking of people who can go to the schools in daytime with the dogs. So we are very worried about that. If you want to participate, and if you have dogs, you want to participate and get trained up, please do email Rose. Rose is here. <laughs> OK, so we need your help. OK, so now I'm telling you the progress of the pilot year. So we developed the curriculum based on uh, things that we did before. In the past, I developed a uh, school-based program based on cognitive behavioral therapy without the dogs. It wasn't that successful in a sense because the curriculum was a bit boring for secondary students. So that's why I incorporate the reading to the dogs into this primary school program, trying to make it more uh, entertaining for the students. So we had our own six picture books. That's the books that the students have to read to the, to the dogs. And each 
trained dogs have their own name card. So when they go into the schools, they wear their name cards. That, that makes the students think they are the staff of the project. So they have to uh, respect the dogs. And these are the storybooks. All these dogs, they are real dogs. They are adopted or they are trained. And they become the uh, characters of the books. The reason is, if the students, after they read the books, and if they can see the real dogs, they would be more interested to find out more about the dogs. So they are not uh, fake characters. OK, so Joe and our teachers will do the sharing about social emotional learning teaching. Then the students have to read to the dogs with the books that we created. And there are different schools. And you can see that the students are actually quite excited when we ask them questions. And kids are quite relaxed. And the dogs are relaxed too. And for us to be able to sustain the learning, do you remember how many sessions that we have for this curriculum? Six, which is rather short. So we developed the uh, so-called service learning component. So after the uh, six sessions that the students have to take for the curriculum, they have to do something after the school and outside the school. So for this particular, particular school, the students have to do something each day. So these are the items, for example, caring for others, talk to others, helping others, and problem solving. These are all the things that we teach the students. So they have to fill in this table. If they have two takes each day, they will collect some uh, uh, stickers or whatever. So with enough stickers, our project will help them to donate some money to this organization is LAP. So we, the, uh, the staff of the LAP comes to the service learning day with the waiting to be adopted dog. This one is uh, the one with some disability. So the students, with their efforts, we donate the money to LAP. And then we tell the students afterwards, now these two dogs are adopted. So they will have the sense of being able to commit, contribute back to the society. This project is new. It's probably one of the very few in, in this region. So the media are very interested in this. So Hong Kong 01 and then Economic Times came to different schools and interviewed with all this. And one really interesting thing we want to share with you is we had DSG last Wednesday, and our team with the collaborators and the Hong Kong U team wanted to do something. Because you know the environment in Hong Kong is not so happy at the moment. So we had an ad hoc initiative called the DSE. Doggy, stand by me, please. Not playing? Okay, so that was what we uh, ad hocly planned for the DSU students. 
we had a, an idea on a Saturday night, and then three days before the DSC got released. We worked together as a team uh, for a year, so we know each other well, so we were able to put everything together in two days. Anyway, so our point is, our team, think that the audience is for the protection of the human, of the animals, right? But if we want to create an environment that is animal friendly, we need early education and exposure to create a caring attitude must be done in, at the very young, young stage. I have been a clinical psychologist for 20 something years and we do have the mental health audience in Hong Kong, but still stigmatization and discrimination for people with mental illness is high. So I guess having an audience is, audience is important, but early education is another way to promote Hong Kong as an animal-friendly place. So because the talk is about welfare, so these are the things that we need to consider when we do animal-assisted interventions or animal-assisted uh, education. So every single time when we go to a new school, we go site visits to look at the place, whether it's animal-friendly or not and we need to check out the space and the parking slots and stuff, then we, for the handlers and the volunteers, we well inform them about their responsibilities and the requirements of bringing dogs into schools. Then schools are asked to provide space for dogs to rest like that, and when they arrive to the schools, and we are very time conscious. So even though our curriculum is like 70 minutes, but the working time for the dogs won't be longer than 20 minutes, so we are not overworking our dogs. And only a small number of students, they can read and touch the dog at the same time so that the dogs won't get overwhelmed by a large crowd of people. Students are encouraged to pass their gain knowledge about the dogs to their peers and parents. So one of the things that we ask our students to do is they have to bring the books back to home and read to the parents and tell the parents what they have learned. So this is spreading to the peers and the parents too. And the briefing are done immediately every single time when we have the lesson. So because each school is different, the setting is different, the environment is different, so we need to make sure that the dogs and the volunteers and the teachers, they all having a good time. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. My time is up. So if you do have anything you want to ask me afterwards, please email me. and. As we said, we need more volunteers if, with the dogs or without the dogs. So if you want to participate, please email Rose, uwhiteman at hk.hk. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Wong. With our speakers, please come to the stage for the Cut Across Dialogue. In this session, our speakers will discuss new ideas for interdisciplinary research or knowledge exchange project ideas and how the work could be enhanced by animal welfare. Okay, so I'm just going to toss out a couple of questions first for our panel to respond to before we open up to everybody else. So please. Think of some good questions that you think that they might be able to, to discuss. So I'm going to sort of pick up on what Paul was saying, but I think also something what Amanda referred to at the beginning. So I said at the beginning that the pet ownership rates in Hong Kong is about 4 or 5 percent uh, cats and dogs. So those are amongst the lowest in the world, right? Most uh, countries have much higher rates than that. And you might argue that's a good thing because Hong Kong is maybe not a very suitable place to keep pets. On the other hand, we have very restrictive rules on people being allowed to keep pets in Hong Kong, uh, particularly for dogs, right? So public housing, you basically need a doctor's certificate in order to be able to keep a dog in many, in many private housing areas. So I was interested, Paul, because I mean, for many of those, those students, I got the impression they'd really never been involved with a pet before, so it was something new to them. It's not something that they already knew how to treat a pet. And one might argue that's maybe why animal welfare is a struggle in Hong Kong, because people don't already have the love of a pet. So what do you think are the important things that could be done in Hong Kong to, to address maybe both pet ownership and 
animal welfare by enabling people to have experience of animals in a, in a safe environment for both the, the humans and for the, for the pets. So maybe I'll give it to you first and then see whether the others would like to comment. Well, thank you, John, for asking this. Um, this is a really big question, actually. So we did a study before, and we asked the owners and the non-owners about the, the mental health and the physical health and the social well-being. Apparently, there are not so much difference between the owners and the non-owners, which is a new finding in the literature, because in the US, in the UK, in Australia, it's always the owners have better health status than the non-owners, okay? So we guess that the benefit is not so pronounced, possibly because the owners cannot take the dogs out so frequently and benefit physically. But on the other hand, the social well-being of owners are actually a little bit better than the non-owners. So we think within the four walls, within the families, the discussions about dogs or animals facilitate the social well-being, okay? Well, that's one issue. The other issue is, I, I'm not sure if not having pets in Hong Kong is a good thing or not, as, as you ask. As you said, one of the things that people have kind of a negative attitude about animals is the lack of exposure. If we, we went to some talks and asked people, when was the last time you see a live animal? People would say, well, two, week, two months ago, I went to a market and saw a chicken. <laughs> and that's basically it, right? So having exposure to animals would be a good thing, at least, to educate the people that the human beings are not the only species <laughs> in, in the city. We have to live under the One Health approach, we have to live if, with animals in, in, in a city. Uh, but then I guess the, for the welfare of, of pets or animals, whether they are living in a small compartment or not is one thing, but educating the owners would be the most crucial thing to do. So they need to be educated that they need to protect the welfare of the animals take them out, make sure that they are not obese because of not going out, and things like this. So possibly SPCA can play a big role in, in doing that. Um, yes, I agree with everything that Paul said, but I think it, it's very important that we understand what responsible pet ownership looks like. And unfortunately, we don't at the moment have legislation that requires people to be responsible owners. We have legislation that is based on um, the duty to ensure that your animal doesn't suffer from overt cruelty, but there's nothing in the legislation that relates to welfare. And as such, currently, there's no requirement that people take their pets out or that people walk their pets or that people do any of the nice things that Paul's been talking about. So it's very important that you take the opportunity right now. AFCD is currently doing a consultation on enhancing animal welfare in Hong Kong. And there is a um, consultation paper on the AFCD's website, which you can all go and look at and give your views on. And I encourage you to support the proposals to change the basis of the law in Hong Kong. The idea is that um, a lot of the things that, that the SPCA and I have been saying for many years are finally going to be taken up. And that is that no longer will we have a backward-looking law that only looks at prevention of cruelty, but we will have a forward-looking law that looks at the duty of care for animals in Hong Kong and requires people to give their animals a life worth living. Uh, so please do go on the AFCD's website. Please do support the proposals to enhance animal welfare. Please take a look at my webpage at Hong Kong U in the law faculty where I have um, uploaded today my own submission to AFCD and to the Legislative Council on this point. And um, please copy and paste as much as you like, but, but do support um, these proposals because we have the opportunity finally to make a difference to the way that pets are kept in Hong Kong, and not just pets, the way that food animals are treated, the way that animals in exhibitions and other um, public places are treated, the way that animals are treated in labs, the way that animals are treated um, that are living wild. So you have an opportunity to affect the real lives of animals everywhere if you support these proposals that AFCD has finally got around to making. So please do take the opportunity to do that. You only have till the end of this month to make your views known. 
So, so is there any reason to believe that attitudes towards pets and looking after them welfare, that side of welfare, is linked to how people feel about animals being used for research or wild animal welfare? Do, do, we, do we know anything about these, these issues? Um, I think that, that most members of the public don't think very hard. I mean, we, you're a self-selected group. I mean, you've come along today to a talk at 5 o'clock on a, on a Tuesday afternoon about animals. So, so obviously you are the types of people that are thinking about these issues. But I don't think that the people on the street are thinking about animals in labs. Um, I certainly don't think they're thinking about wild animals. They're certainly not thinking about wildlife trade. It's been very difficult, and I'm sure Dave can speak to that, to get, to get traction um, in relation to people caring about endangered species. Um, people think it's not a problem. They don't, don't think it's got anything to do with them. So because they don't have um, you know, a great big uh, hunting trophy hanging on their walls, they think it's not their problem. But of course, it's everybody's problem because it is organized crime. It is coming through our territory and uh, it's, it's being laundered in some cases as legal product when in fact it's illegal product. So it is all of our problems and I think we all care about the fact that other species are going extinct because we're not paying enough attention. So Kelvin and David, maybe I can push you guys a little bit to, you know, do you see a connection between our attitudes, welfare, and different types of animals? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think touching on what Paul was, was mentioning earlier is really empathy and being able to empathize with, with the animal. Um, and exposure to animals surely can contribute to empathy, the development of empathy. Having that emotional connection to another species can be very powerful. Uh, and I think this is really, uh, it's empathy that I think underpins a lot of the environmental movement that I think personally is really taking off in Hong Kong and China as well. And as evidence of that, we see more and more student groups that are engaged and active uh, on issues like this uh, or concerned about the environment and other green issues. So it's very encouraging to see the younger generation really taking a different stance than perhaps their parents and their grandparents did uh, with not just animal welfare issues but also with environmental issues in general. So I sort of remain a hopeless optimist <laughs> on some of these things and you know so if we can stem the tide of the demand um, at this juncture and and allow species to persist into the future then there may be hope for some sustainable actions so Kelvin you talked about the exciting part of it's not organs but it's organoid organoids right so so is, do you think that's basically people are doing it to save money or do you think there is really that's also being driven by changing attitudes to welfare. I think it's both. Um, definitely it's like, on one hand, uh, building organoids, of course, much more human-like stuff, animal. Humans are quite different from other animals. So having something that is done on human cells is supposed to be more representative in some ways. But at the same time, you can reduce a lot of animal experiments because you're doing it on human cells and which will likely eliminate those experiments that are not going to be fruitful at all in animals. So I think it's uh, one stone, two birds kind of thing. You know? So um, I don't think people started organoid for the benefits of animal welfare, but it definitely benefited the animal as well. So uh, may I speak a bit, bit on pets? I'm a layman in terms of pets. I'm not an expert at all. But I would like to say that... Um, Yes, I mean, in Hong Kong, um, I, I wasn't a pet owner before. I'm, I, was, I started my have my own pet about 10 years ago, which I love now. And the thing is, I noticed when pets are free, I mean, when people see pets, they always have a smiley face. So even people who are depressed or patients who are depressed, whenever they see pets, most of them are much more happy than before, or students, as you see. So, but what happened is sometimes um, some people, non-pet owners, hate animals because some pet owners are being not responsible. So I think it's a vicious cycle. If pet owners are keeping their pets nicely, they keep them from disturbing others, they clean up before, then people who are not pet owners will, will be more receptive to them and more, more likely to interact with them and understand the benefits of interacting with pets. So I think it's a vicious cycle. And I'm, I'm actually very optimistic. Uh, in the past few years, I'm seeing more and more uh, places and more people who are open 
to pet owners, uh, which I am one of them. And uh, I, I think there's a good trend and with the uh, uh, legislations or uh, the impacts, I think this is a good direction. Thank you all very much. So can I, just to round off this session, maybe ask you each just to say one key research theme which you think can help significantly. It doesn't necessarily have to be your own research theme, although it may well be, but some, some area where you think academics can help improve animal welfare in the broadest sense, whether it's wild animals or lab animals or, or uh, pets. Paul? Well, the, um, the science about um, human annual in interactions are not so solid. Many of the studies I've done before, it's not so rigorous. So if there are some more studies that can um, measure the biological changes of the animals when they interact with human beings, vice, vice versa, measuring the biological changes while they interact with the animals. If we can prove that, the improvement of endorphins or, or whatever during, while they are interacting, that would be much more convincing than using the self-subjective uh, uh, report scales data. Well, that's a tough question. I, I'm a firm, firm believer in, in, in the type of programs that, that Paul was presenting because, you know, the unfortunate consequence of being a university professor is that, uh, like was said earlier, we, we preach to the choir, right? Where, you know, many of my students that are in ecology and biodiversity, they're there because they're passionate about environmental issues. So uh, I'm just, you know, preaching to people who have the same I ethics and ideals that I might have. But, but early childhood education is where you can develop that empathy for wildlife. And I think that that empathy is, uh, is a lifelong uh, characteristic and something that, that affects decision making. Um, you know, for example, many people choose their own diet based on empathy towards animals. Um, and I think that when we look at some of the conservation success stories that we've had in this region, uh, a lot of those have been pushed by NGOs and celebrities who have brought awareness to these issues. You know, in many cases, people do things out of habit and out of tradition. Uh, shark fin soup, great example of that. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> debatable, I guess. Um, but breaking those traditions and, and using empathy as a vehicle for doing so, I think, is really important. I think for animal research, we must do more research on understanding the pain and distress of the animal. And I don't think enough is done yet. There's a lot of research on this, but I think not enough is done. Because if you understand how animals feel the pain or distress or fear, then you know how to tackle them. And I think knowing how to tackle them will greatly improve the welfare of animals in laboratories. Um, as a lawyer, I think uh, the most important thing is that we consider how we can use the law to change the world to be a better place for animals. And that's what I try to teach in my animal law course every year. The students come in and they think that, that really we're just going to talk about dogs and cats for, for 12 weeks, and, and we don't. We talk about law, and we talk about philosophy, and we talk about animal welfare science, and we talk about um, how all of those things need to influence one another, that you can't have good law unless it's based on good animal welfare science. And we talk about how it's one thing to say we've got laws and, and to point the finger at perhaps at countries that don't have laws and say, well, aren't we better? But in fact, legislation is only as good as what it's actually able to, to do. And a lot of the legislation that we have, unfortunately, doesn't do what it says it's going to do. And only when those problems are pointed out and we sit down and start to think about the kinds of law reform that we need, and then we take the opportunity to, to change our laws, um, can the situation be improved for other species. And where those opportunities arise and we know what we need to do, um, we need to all get on board and make sure those things happen. Do we have a, a question or a point somebody wants to make? Yes. Can we bring the mic to this young man here? Uh, so my name is Kelvin. Uh, I was a research staff in the Faculty of Education. Uh, so my question is, um, do you consider the relatively lacking of, I mean, of con on, in concern on animals? 
a problem related to really a lack of formal education in the curriculum, or it's more like a culture matter? Because, I mean, I have pets in my home, but my parents don't consider this as a good thing because they think that pets or animals, like a dogs, are only for tools. I mean, you know, a lot of Chinese are keeping their dogs as a guard dogs at home, and a lot of people just take birds as a way to, to show off themselves. Do you consider this as more related a cultural problem, or is it simply a lack of education? Well, this is a very difficult question, honestly speaking, because <laughs> my view, obviously, animal has not been a discussed topic or prioritized topic within the curriculum in, in probably in Asia in, in general, right? Then again, it's a cultural issue too, and now people are still debating about whether we should keep dogs like this or whether we should keep dogs, uh, the Mongol dogs for security guard dogs and whatever. So we still have this kind of debates within the culture. And caring too much for the dogs would be like a, 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 a scene, even within the family for debates, you know. So there are a lot of issues that need to be discussed. But that's why having this kind of platform is a really crucial thing. So, so maybe I can, I'll, I'm going to bring Amanda in again because one of the things that fascinated me was with some of Amanda's previous work uh, on animal welfare is, the, is from my perspective, the government didn't really want to change the, the animal welfare laws. But the interesting thing was that whichever side you're on, so today we're in this very calm environment. There may be people outside there demonstrating. So whichever side you're on in Hong Kong, it doesn't matter whether you want to label yourself as a pan-democrat or as a pro-Beijing, still everybody believes in animal welfare, or at least there are people within all those groups. So it seems to be an issue that people feel strongly about, which has nothing to do with politics, if I can put it that way. So, yes, there may be cultural elements, but it's not a political culture element. So I think there is, it's possible to find people who want to change the world and improve it, who have, regardless of your political views. So in Hong Kong, that means it's an opportunity, right? Because I think that's, that's why the law got changed, is because Amanda and the SPCA found people across the different groups in, in LegCo who said, yes, we need to change the law. So if it is culture, I think it's the culture that we can change because we can find leadership of people in society who want to change and improve things. Is that, that's a different way of answering your question, perhaps. Yes, we've got somebody back here. Um, thank you for these uh, brilliant talks, right? And uh, actually, I want to express my ground that I fully support uh, animals' welfare. But I would like to share with you an experience. Um, because some friends of my own, and also one of my family members, um, although it may sound a bit strange to you, they are really afraid of dogs. Okay, I, 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 I don't know whether you understand some a small percentage of people are uh, really afraid of dogs. And um, uh, sometimes when I, when I go out to the street with my family member and the people is going to have uh, dogs with them, and they, she's always hiding behind me and um, doing things. But, but people don't understand. They say that, oh, it's cute. Do you have a touch of it? And... The family member actually will, uh, no, please don't, and is sh shaking. But I, I think that, um, uh, can, and, and then sometimes when I ask, can you t please take the lead of your do own dog, please? And, and some guys will say to me that, no need, because it will restrict the freedom of the dog. Okay, the dog have to move around, you know? You restrict its freedom. I don't, well, that, I, I don't understand why, why you're so afraid of that. Okay, be brave. Next time, carry on. Well, I I do find from this incident, although it it's a bit strange to you, uh, would that be a strike of the balance between animal welfare and also a small group of people who really don't like it? And because to my family member, sure. it's 
by law is it's really I, I, like a new system. I think Kelvin made the point very well. It's about education, and I think it's education of both sides. It's education of the pet owner, but it's also education of the non-pet owner. So actually, I don't find your story surprising. Um, about 10 years ago, when my children were young, I was walking around Wan Chai trying to buy them a bicycle, and I walked into a bicycle shop, and I got bitten by a dog. And I mean, I got bitten with drawing blood. So I actually had to go and have a tetanus injection. My wife wanted me to have a rabies shot, but I wasn't going to do that. But I mean, so that experience, yes, even if it hasn't happened to you personally, you've heard a story of somebody who had a traumatic experience with an animal. This is reality. People have those experiences. The question is, do you have some other education or experience to realize that actually most dogs are like him, who are very tame and friendly, but if you've only ever had a negative experience, you don't realize, or you've only ever heard a negative experience. And I think you've also illustrated very nicely, right? If the pet owner doesn't understand their responsibilities, uh, particularly in an urban environment, to keep their pet on a leash, then yes, that clearly also is going to be a problem, right? That also makes people paranoid. Come on, it's not just me, right? Come on, who would like to, to comment? Yes, Kelvin? I, I comment because I have the same feeling as you. Um, I, I, I've seen many, many people who are irris so ir irresponsible that their dogs are barking and they're, they're very big and they just let them in the park running around. So that's what I mean when I say a vicious cycle. If you have more and more people like this, then more and pe more people are antagonistic against pet owners, although most of the pets are not like that at all. So I think education, as uh, you said, is very important for pet owners. You have to respect each other. You have to respect the rights, not the rights, I would say. You have to respect that some non-owners, they don't hate dogs, but they're just afraid or whatever experience, they, they don't like to touch dogs. You have to respect them. Uh, if you have a dog which is more fierce, big, you have to be careful when they go on the street. I think this is very mutual respect for everybody, which I hopefully, if more people are more responsible, then you know, they, they, dog owners and non-dog owners can live happily together. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you all four for your lovely talks. Um, I know it didn't come up today, but I did want to ask about animals in captivity, um, like we have at Hong Kong Botanical Gardens, um, and I guess also Ocean Park, although I suppose that's pub uh, private, privately owned. Um, I was just wondering, because you were saying the importance of research and um, statistics and so on, I was just wondering if you know of any studies that are happening uh, with animals in captivity in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, and also, I guess as a second question, what your opinion is on the animal welfare laws, um, how they're going to affect the animals in captivity at the moment, and whether uh, you know, we need additional ones or what your thoughts are. Thank you. Okay, shall I answer that? Yeah, um, I'm not aware of any, st well, certainly no studies in my, um, in my faculty going on in relation to animals in captivity. I mean, certainly animals in captivity studies are transferable across jurisdictions because they're generally animal welfare science studies. So, so a study that suggests that an animal in, in a certain, um, of a certain species in a certain type of confinement, confinement will suffer in a particular way is obviously transferable to, to Hong Kong. So we don't necessarily need to do studies within this jurisdiction to make those points. Um, uh, the duty of care issue that I raised earlier will not just affect animals that are kept as pets, it will affect animals in every context. So currently the legislation that, that controls the keeping of animals in Hong Kong um, involves a series of regulations that are about uh, sanitary um, conditions and uh, the safety of the public and there is nothing in them at all about animal welfare. So if the amendment to CAP 169 that's being proposed goes through, that will make a difference for animals in captivity because what the amendment will do is it will require that every animal in whatever context, so we're not just talking about pets, we're talking about other animals as well, every animal in whatever context will have to have its needs met uh, on a reasonable basis. So, so for um, an animal that's confined in a zoo, for example, or in, or in Ocean Park, um, what its reasonable needs might be can be objectively quantified and then that duty of care can be applied to that particular animal. 
So it is an absolute game changer for animals in all contexts. And that's one of the reasons why everybody in this room, whether they care about dogs and cats or not, should be supporting the Cat 169 Amendment because it's not just going to affect dogs and cats. Amanda, can I ask you, do one thing we, nobody has mentioned so far is breeding. Mm -hmm. So we know that in Hong Kong there are a lot of issues around breeding. So how, how will this fit into that? Well, um, when we got the, the breeding law passed a couple of years ago, uh, which um, introduced requirements for every person that is breeding dogs, and it will be rolled out to other species too, but at the moment it affects dog breeding. Every person who, who breeds dogs and sells their dogs now is required to have a license which means that um, most, of the, most of the breeders that previously were arguing they were hobby breeders, in fact they were puppy mills, um, now has to have a license. So AFCD has the right to access their premises and check on the welfare of their animals. Um, what we also got right, written into that law, the SPCA and I, was that all breeders owe their animals a duty of care. So it was the first duty of care that had ever been recognised in animal welfare legislation and now, two years later, it should be rolled out for all of the other animals and all of the other um, different, different contexts in which animals are kept. That's what this amendment to CAT 169 will do. It will roll out that duty of care that we've already got a foot in the door um, on in relation to pet breeding. Thank you. There was a gentleman here, I think, next. So this question is for, for Kelvin. I was wondering if you could comment on sort of what the restraints are prospects for for the further development of more robust modeling uh, like the you developed in your lab, right? So we, what are the prospects of getting to sort of like full human simulation in the future to be able to completely obviate you know, like the use of, of animals in, in testing in general? And then as sort of a related sort of curiosity on the, on the policy level, how much, how many like public initiatives are there and funding to develop these models? Are they primarily being developed like in private context and being like patented by pharmaceutical companies and things like that? Like, so what, what is sort of is the, the nature of sort of like the collective development of this type of technology? Okay. So for your first question, I think in organ noise that I show you is just a beginning. So these are very primitive and of course it cannot replace animals yet in terms of, for example, they don't have immune cells which we have, they don't have some structures, they don't have blood supplies and all these things. But I think as the technology develops, they would more and more likely mimic the real organs to the point that maybe we can just test drugs on these organs without going through animal experiments. And people will accept these drugs to go into clinical trial without animal experiments. I think that's the way to go if possible. Okay, so for your second question, uh, there are initiatives, not in Hong Kong, I, I don't think there's initiative in Hong Kong, but at least in England or in Australia, that they have, uh, for example, in, I think it's in England, they, the, they have some initiative in uh, um, the animal welfare. And specifically, they stated that more research should be done on these uh, animal welfare kind of studies. I, I'm not, I, I don't know exactly what grants are available for these, but I'm sure with these uh, official documents coming out, there will be more incentive for the government or grant agency to uh, 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 to promote the animal welfare research. The issue of ownership is a pretty important one, right? Because I think there is, uh, because I'm interested in innovation technology issues, so I, there's a vast amount of money being poured into the models, I think. That's, that's the honest truth. But whether this, whether the knowledge ultimately will be open access or will be patented is a challenge, I think. That, that is still a, likely to be a problem, right? I mean, Hong Kong, I mean, Hong Kong, in theory, you could get money. So I sit on the grant review board of the Food and Health Bureau here. So it wouldn't be a problem to get some research funding here. But I think the sums of research funding in Hong Kong are tiny compared to the sums of money that are needed to do some of these things. So you basically have to go into much deeper pools like the NIH in the US or the National Science Foundation in China to do the, the really big stuff, right? But I think that still is very small money compared to the money that um, the private sector, the venture capitalists can, can turn up for people who come up with the, the really big, big modeling stuff, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, just talk about patenting for these technology. Um, I, so far, I don't think it's a big problem yet. 
For example, uh, organoids. Uh, these are not, I mean, you can find the information on how to make these organoids in public domain. They're not really secrets. So, for example, our collaborator, they welcome many, many people from around the world to go to Holland, to the center, to learn in how to make these organoids. So, in terms of patenting for these issues, it's not really a problem yet. But, uh, yes, the money going into these research, of course, the drug company are not going to do it unless there are incentive for them to do it. So whether the government can give them some incentive to do this kind of research, I, I don't know. Maybe it's open for discussion. Okay, so we're, we're just about out of time. I think we have, do we have a last question? If not, uh, please join me in thanking our speakers uh, for their time. Thank you, everyone. On behalf of the Knowledge Exchange Office, we would like to extend our deepest appreciation and gratitude to all our distinguished guests and speakers for being here with us today. It's been a pleasure to host this event. May I now invite everyone to move to the foyer for tea and chat to continue the Knowledge Exchange. And I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you.